praise. We say thank you so much for making it possible that we can gather together to worship you, to praise you, to glorify you, to magnify your name. We thank you for your holy presence that's here today. I submit and commit myself and the ministry of the word of God into your hands. I'm asking you once again to think through my thoughts, speak through my focal cords, take full control of your word going forth. Let it minister to your people the way you would have it to. Let a fresh anointing rest upon your people to hear your word, to receive your word, and help us all to be truly doers of your word. Give us all deeper spiritual understanding. Let revelation knowledge flow unto every one of us individually and collectively. And I thank you, Father, by your spirit. You're always confirming your word with signs, wonders, and miracles. Yes. Once again, I pray that your holy word will be exalted and magnified and Jesus will be yes, glorified Lord. in the ministry of your word and that your will will be done in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <clears throat> Glory to God. Second Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1. The Word of God says, Paul the Apostle writes to Timothy, it was over 2,000 years ago, he said, this, this know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. And he goes on to say, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, Without natural affection, interesting, without natural affection, no longer natural. Right? In other words, the way God created us to be natural is no longer there. Truth breakers, <clears throat> false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. We're living in days and age, we're living in a day where men call that which is good evil and that which is evil good traitors heady high-minded a lot of people are intellectual there's nothing wrong with being intellectual but they've allowed their they've allowed their ability to be intellectual to bring in pride where they've shut god out of their lives totally they have nothing to do with god because they're so smart so to speak and they despise anything that's good. They despise what is God, what is godly. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Be careful you don't fall into that trap. A lot of people love pleasure. We're created for pleasure. Just the way God created us. Our bodies are that way, designed that way. But we shouldn't put it first and let it become an idol. Amen. Right? And a lot of people have put pleasure before God. And therefore, that has become an idol. The Bible says in Psalm 16, the last verse, that there's pleasures forevermore at the right side of God. That's true pleasures. You want true pleasure? Plug into God. Yes. And then when we get over on the other side, we will, be, we will be in a position to fully enjoy eternity for all the pleasures God has for us. Glory to God. Don't settle for earthly pleasure and let it become an idol. Because some folks have. Right? So, Paul the Apostle warns Timothy, warning the church, these words still stand. Okay? <clears throat> this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. We are definitely living in the last days. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it talks about the Messiah, Jesus. He said that when he came, it was called the last days. That was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years later, we've got to be at the last of the last days. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So perilous times means dangerous. Yeah. We individually and collectively need to be aware of what's going on around us so that we know how to conduct ourselves. And I would encourage you not to fall asleep spiritually. Do not allow yourself to fall asleep spiritually. Many Christians are. And especially when, as the days come and the summer is coming, the warm weather, nice weather is coming, and uh, it looks like things will open up to some degree and all that. Some folks who never took time to really plug in the way they should have during this COVID period this last year and a bit, they're going to be distracted and they're going to miss God. 
and fall into the trap of what the enemy is in the process of unfolding in this world. The scripture tells us in Luke chapter 21, we ought to be praying this pray, prayer, and if you're praying it, you're going to be aware of it. It says in Luke chapter 21, verse 36, pray that you may be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. And the reason why Jesus said those words because he knew the time will come where some people will begin to uh, uh, slack off, if I could use that word, will lose sight, will lose focus. Other things will become more important, be distracted and miss out. Matthew chapter 24. If you go there with me, the word of God says here, and Jesus is speaking in verse 36. He says, but of that day and hour, no, sorry, that's, I didn't want to go there. I want to go to verse 37, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we've always got to keep that in mind yes. and, 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 and understand what was it like during the days of Noah. Because if we can understand what it was like in the days of Noah, we'll be able to uh, see what to look for for the coming of the Son of Man. Because the scripture says, but as it, the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, it's going to be similar. It's going to be the same. This is what Jesus is saying here. Amen. Okay? For as in the days that, there were, that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the, into the ark. In other words, it was normal living. People were doing normal things and knew not until the flood came. In other words, when the flood came, they were taken by surprise. Mm -hmm. And took them away, in other words, they perished. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus has given us a warning. It says it's going to be like in the days of Noah. Right? So then, let's go back again. We can look at scriptures from a different perspective today. To Genesis chapter 6. For a moment. Because in Genesis chapter 6, hallelujah, today's message, of us, of if there was, I have to give it a title, I'll call it, is a, a great deception. All right? There's a deception that's unfolding as, we, as I speak. The enemy is at work. He's not waiting until the church is removed to start to bring his deception. He's already at work. He is busy. He's not sleeping when you and I go to sleep. And he's unfolding his deception. And as believers, we need to be aware of that deception. And so that we know how to handle ourselves and we don't fall into the traps. All right? So in Genesis chapter 6, I trust that you're there with me. The Word of God says, I'm reading from verse 1. The Word of God says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of which... Sorry, let me read that again. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. In other words, you may be asking, who are the sons of God? In this particular text, the sons of God are not human beings. They are angels. All right? Okay. And it says here, and took them wives. When you look up the Hebrew word for that, it means they forced them. Yeah. It, they, they, it, this was not um, uh, a, 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 a consent. Okay. 
This was not something that the women agreed to. All right, it was not consensual. All right, it was forced. It's like when a man rapes a woman. In other words, a man forces himself on a woman. All right. So these sons of God, these angels, forced themselves on women. They took women by force. The women had no choice. The women I'm talking about are human beings. Okay. All right. Um, so. Verse 3 says, and the Lord said, and now we can see, so, so when all this happened, you can see why God said what he said in verse 3. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. In other words, I'm not, I'm, geez, God is saying, I'm not going to put up with this. This is not how I created man to be. All right. As a result of verse 2, where the sons of God forced themselves on women, in other words, they took women by force and had sexual relationships with them, we see the results in verse 4. Verse 4 says, There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. When this scripture is talking about mighty men, in other words, these, these, these um, I'm going to call them hybrids, mm -hmm. half human, half angelic. They were able to do things more than the natural human being can do. Are you all here today? Yes. Okay. All right, then. I just want to make sure. In other words, they had supernatural ability over and above the average human being. Supernatural ability in the area of uh, leadership, sports, entertainment, whatever man can do, they can do and better. So when the scripture says that these became mighty men and the, of old men of renown, it's not necessarily in a good sense. They were able to accomplish things over and above what natural man would be able to do. And the Bible says, verse 5, it says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and you could understand this now because the offspring of the sons of God and the women human beings produce giants the Hebrew word calls them Nephilims Nephilims is a hybrid Human and angelic. Nephilim also means fallen. So these angels that had sexual relationship with human beings are no longer holy angels. They've disobeyed the laws of God. They've fallen from their first estate. They've left what God provided for them and they've come down to a man's level taken on a human form and had relationships with women and caused them to become pregnant and caused them to give birth. The Bible says very limited information about this, but enough for us to understand this. We have to understand what the enemy is up to. His goal is in chapter 3 of Genesis when God told him that his head is going to be crushed by the seed of the woman, meaning the Messiah. His goal is to prevent the Messiah from coming through the human race. Remember, he has a problem with man. 
When God created man, the Bible says he created man a little lower than the angels. God placed him on planet Earth in the Garden of Eden and gave him authority and dominion over all the works of God's hands that God created. Satan saw this and his angels and they're jealous. They're envious. Now, prior to that, the angels of God had al some, a third of them had already fallen. Eons ago before God created man, Satan led a rebellion in heaven and a third of the angels fell. In other words, they were no longer in a right relationship with God. And when they fell, it was over. God judged them. They were cast out. Satan lost his position. The Bible says in Ezekiel, he was the anointed cherub. He was originally in charge of planet Earth and probably a lot more than that. The Bible says that he had tablets of musical instruments all in him. He led uh, uh, worship in heaven. He had a very prominent position in heaven. So in time, when pride was found in him, sin was found in him, and God judged him and God cast him out, demoted him. As time went on, God decided to create human beings. God said, let us make man in our image. And God did. And for the time being, God made human beings a little lower than the angels. Yes, so when the enemy saw all of this, of course, what do you think is going to happen? Jealousy, envy, yes. hatred yes. is going to be part of that. Yes. So hence, when God told Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, of all the trees in this garden you can eat except for one tree, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of that tree, but everything else you can eat. God spoke that to Adam. Adam was responsible to tell it to his wife because when God spoke it to Adam, Eve was not there. She had not yet been brought forth. Yes. Nevertheless, you all know the story. Eve took of the fruit, she ate of it, she gave her husband, he took of it deliberately. He knew exactly what was going to happen because God says the day you eat of that fruit, you will die. Yes. And the day that the, he ate of it, they did die. They died spiritually. Oh, That's right. Remember, the Bible says, with God, a thousand earth years is like a day with God. Adam did not live past a thousand years. He lived to 930 years. He fell short of 70 years. My Lord. And that is significant. We could talk about 70, but we're not. It's significant he fell short of 70 years. Because the number 70 it has some biblical prophetic uh, implications in the Bible. So Adam fell short of that. He did die the same day from God's perspective. Not from man's perspective, he went on to live for a little bit, for quite some time. In earth years, he died at 930 years. But sin set in, death came in. As a result of all that, it opened up the door for chapter six to take place, for these fallen angels to get access to come in and pollute the human race. Yes. If Adam had not opened that door, chapter 6 could not have taken place. But the Bible says sin produces death. Jesus. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And when this happened, it affected the whole human race. When I say the whole human race, everyone that was in Adam's loins. Every human being that will come after him would be born in sin, shaped in iniquity. That's why we find in the New Testament, the Bible tells us 
that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah. Every human being needs to repent. Every human being needs to make it right with God. Every human being needs to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, confess their sins, and get into a right relationship with God. Amen. All this is a result of the first Adam, the sin that he committed. Thanks be to God for the second Adam, which is Jesus, Praise God. who came, and because he was obedient to God the Father, all the way, laid down his life for you and myself, glory to God, shed his precious blood, his blood was untainted, his blood is able to wash our sins away and the guilt of consciousness. He is the second Adam. Thank God. Adam was the first Adam. Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus brings grace. Jesus brings uh, eternal life. Glory to God. All that Adam lost, the first Adam, Jesus brings and makes it available for you and myself. Okay? But the enemy's plan in chapter 6 was to pollute the human race. And he was doing a very good job of it. Because if we continue reading, you can see there was only one family line left that had not had their genes polluted. Mm -hmm. What do we see here? Let me just continue. I'm going back to verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. No wonder he can't think right because he's a hybrid. Are you all seeing this? Yes. Okay, okay well, let me just pull, pull, pull back for a moment. Okay? Look, saints, they're no longer fully 100% human beings. Mm -hmm. They're mixed mm -hmm. with demonic DNA. Right. Yeah. These fallen angels, mm -hmm. these have now produced the result of the fallen angels with human beings produce a new species called Nephilims. It's a hybrid. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Angelic and man, but not a good angelic. It is evil. Uh -huh. And therefore, let's just fast track for a moment. Let's go to the book of Revelations for a moment. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk. You know in the book of Revelations, the Bible says that in I believe it's chapter 13. Anybody during the days of tribulation, any human being that takes the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of the beast, they cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It is over for them from God's perspective. Yes. Yes. And I'm, I'm assuming those of you listening to me, you're familiar with these scriptures. And therefore, the scripture is very clear and warning that nobody should take the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of the beast, because if they do, they'll be cut off from God, and they'll suffer great eternal punishment from that point onwards when they leave the land of the living. You're still with me? Yes. Why is that? Because they're no longer human beings. When they take that mark in the future, they will no longer qualify to be a human being. Something is going to change in them. Mm -hmm. Their DNA is going to change. They're no longer going to be a 100% human being that is a candidate for salvation. Mm -hmm. Do you all understand this? Yes. And that's why when we read in the book of Revelations, God is so serious about this, and He doesn't want this to happen. He sends an angel throughout the heavens in the book of revelations preaching the gospel yes. so that the whole world will hear the gospel mm -hmm. the word of god tells us jesus said the end will not come until the gospel has been preached in the entire world mm -hmm. Amen. the church has done a very good job up until now mm -hmm. but god is going to ensure that everyone that's in the land of the living is going to hear the gospel message during those last days because an angel will fly throughout the heavens and proclaiming if anybody takes the mark of the peace, I paraphrase this, it's over for them. Mm -hmm. 
and one of them don't take it. Hallelujah. All right. Yeah. So we go back to Genesis chapter six. Mm -hmm. The human race is almost fully polluted, but it's not fully polluted because let me just continue reading. All right. I'm going to read the verse six and and he repented the Lord that he had made man in the earth and he grieved him in his heart. Now you have to understand, I won't go into this detail, but if you were to read chapter 6 and chapter 7 of the book of Enoch and some chapters in the book of Jeshar, they talk about what happened. These are Jewish traditions, Jewish history. I'll give you some background. These fallen angels came down and they saw the beauty of man and they lusted after the beauty of man. I'm talking about the women and they conspired amongst themselves and then entered into an agreement amongst themselves that they will stay true to this agreement, that they'll go and, 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 and take the women and pollute the women and defile the women and also defile themselves. Amen. When God saw, uh, they taught them things that they were not supposed to teach. They taught them the secrets of eons ago, what the angels know that man did not need to know. One of them, they taught them how to, how, to, how to build weapons, how to kill each other. They taught them sorcery. They taught them uh, 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 the occult. They taught them all kinds of things that were not necessarily good and God did not necessarily want man to know them from that perspective. In those books, they're called watchers. Their role was to be, uh, uh, they, they had a godly role, but they fell and they corrupted it and therefore they taught man corruption. Hence, by the time you reach um, uh, verse 5, God saw this, this great wickedness. Man is not, his imagination is continually evil. He can't think right from God's perspective. It's all evil, right? Verse 6, he, re he repents that he ever made man. Uh, verse 7, he says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and the fowls of the air. For it repents me that I have made them. All right. Why? Because of all of this pollution. Yeah. Amen. All right. And these offspring of these of the of, of the of the, the Nephilims, they just went around and destroyed everything. They ate everything, mm -hmm. and, and and they turned on the animals, they turned on the humans, and they, even to the point where they were eating human flesh. They taught men how to how to uh, uh, have hybrids with animals. What's going on today in science? Well, if you were to do a search on the internet, you can see all kinds of work is going on and taking one animal with another animal and producing what? Hybrids. Yeah. Yeah. True. Right? Yeah. They've got secret labs where they're doing things with human beings mm -hmm. where they're not going to publicly tell you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes some things leak out, but this is going on as I speak. Yeah. You see? So all kinds of evil was taught to the human man, to, to the human. So the Bible says, by the time we get to verse 8, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, why did he find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Well, the next verse tells us this. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Amen. And Noah walked with God. I mean, Noah had a relationship with God. But here's the thing. You see what the word says? perfect in his generation, it means that it's to do with his genetic pool, his genetics, okay? meaning that his genes were not polluted. His genes had not been polluted. It was still, he was still a hundred percent, hundred percent human being. And because he was still a hundred percent human being, therefore his sons were and his son's daughters were. The Bible doesn't tell us, but when you read some history, his son's daughters were relatives of the, the former, um, if you read chapter five, uh, some of the godly folks that came before Noah. Amen. Hallelujah. And therefore when it says perfect in his generation, not that he was perfect as a human being, it means that because we all have faults, isn't that true? Yeah. We all have faults. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes. Every human being does. 
but meaning that his genetic pool, his gen genes had not been polluted. Thank God. And God was able to work with him. And God, as you all, you all know the story, God you spoke to Noah. Noah built an ark. Noah and his sons and their sons' wives, and Noah and his wives, eight of them all together, including Noah, and the animals went in the ark and their lives were preserved. What happened? The Bible tells us that uh, in verse 11, the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. This is the result of the hybrid. This is the result of the mixture because this is what the, 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 these fallen angels taught men what to do. And you see, and they don't have a mind for God. And likewise, in the book of Revelation, during the tribulation days, those who take the mark of the beast will not have a mind for God. Yes. They will be going against God because they have a nature of the devil. Right? But this is what was going on in chapter 6 of the book of Genesis. Because the scripture says the earth was filled with what? Violence. Yes. Okay? This is what these Nephilims do or have been doing. And verse 12 says, The Lord looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Well, we all know the story. Now we know why God brought judgment. Because the human race except for Noah and his family, was what? Polluted. Mm -hmm. Beyond... I was going to use the word repair. Beyond hope, beyond reconciliation, beyond the hope of getting saved. Yes. That's why we do not see anyone outside of Noah's family mm -hmm. repenting. And that's why we also will see in the book of Revelations, during the tribulation days, those that take the mark of the beast, they will not repent because they cannot repent because they've got a demonic nature now. Yes, preacher. Truth. Amen. The fallen angels cannot repent. There's no hope for them. And the offspring of the fallen angels cannot repent. And therefore, those who take the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, the number of the beast, during the tribulation days, they cannot repent. Mm -hmm. And this is the same thing that was going on in the days of Noah. And hence, Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Yeah. He says, the same thing you saw going on back then mm -hmm. is going to be happening in the times of coming of the Son of Man. So we need to really take time to understand this, since because if we don't, we're not. We got to understand these scriptures so we know how to conduct ourselves and going forward. Because God, God destroyed the earth back then during the flood, the Noah's flood, and Noah and his family are the ones who survive. So the question I'd ask yourself: Did it resolve the problem? It only resolved the problem temporarily because shortly after that, what do we read in the Bible? There's giants in the land again. Okay? So somewhere along the, the line, through the descendants of Noah's sons, they allowed themselves to be polluted and the giants are again back in the land. Does this make sense now? When is when let's fast track a little bit. Israel is in the wilderness. They're about to go into the promised land, the land of Canaan. You can you can you can uh, do the genealogy and 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 uh, realize that the, the 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 descendants of of uh, Ham. One of his descendant lines is, 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 is are those who inhabited the land of Canaan. Somewhere along the line, the descendants of Ham allowed themselves to become polluted and giants were in the land because 
By the time Israel is ready to go into the promised land, God told them and he said, when you go into the promised land, I'm going to use you to remove them. There were giants in the land. You are not to spare any women. You are not to spare any children. You are not to spare any old people. You are not to spare any of them. You are to completely destroy them. Don't keep one alive. Yeah. Why? Is this beginning to make sense now, saints? It's not because God was so callous and hard, but he knew that these group of people could never get saved, mm -hmm. would never get saved, because their DNA is not right. Preach. And therefore, don't take the side and... Those of you who may not know the Bible very well, and some people will come along and tell you, well, what kind of God are you serving that kills women and children or allows or tells the Israelites in the Old Testament to go off and kill women and children? They don't understand. And unfortunately, many Christians don't understand why God took that position. And if you understood, you'd be, you'd be able to realize, okay, these people are not 100% human beings from God's perspective, yes, yes. and therefore, they need to go. Yes. They need to go. Yes. Hallelujah. We see in Numbers chapter 13, go there with me, there's a familiar story you know. The Bible tells us that Shortly after, approximately 18 months after the Israelites came out of Egypt, God was ready to take them into the promised land, but you all know the story. They weren't ready, were they? No. Numbers 13. Right? Mm -hmm. We see here again, this is after the Noah's flood. This is many years later. Israel had... Spent some time in uh, Egypt. They're in the wilderness. And Moses sends out spies to go spy out the land. Yeah. And the Bible says in chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 30, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Mm -hmm. And so they did, because physically, that's the way they saw. Because these men are bigger. Mm -hmm. They're larger. Yes. They are physically stronger. Remember, I was telling you just a moment ago, they, have, uh, they can do things much better mm -hmm. than the natural human being. Yes. Okay? Because they're mixed. Yes. Right? Amen. Okay. Verse 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched out unto the children of Israel, saying, The land though which we sorry, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. In other words, they're large. Mm -hmm. And there were giants. Who are those? Those are Nephilim. Yes. Sons of Anak are part. Oh, I'm going to, it talks about the, the Anak, so I'm saying this. The sons of Anak were also part of the Nephilim, okay? Which come of the giants. And we were in their own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Because they saw them that way. You see? Yeah. Yeah. Now, because all of this is coming to the forefront these days that we're living in, we're gonna, you're going to hear more and more of this. You're going to see more and more of this. Yeah. And, and that's why I believe the Lord would have me to just start talking on this subject, because this may be a strange subject to some of you who have never heard anything like this before. Um, we need to become familiar with this, because there's an unpopular uh, biblical view, unpopular bi biblical view. It's not biblical, but it's unpopular. In other words, the Bible doesn't support this that Nephilims are space aliens. Okay? What does the Bible tell us? 
the Bible tells us that they are a result of the offspring of the fallen angels and human beings. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. The Bible tells us they existed before the flood and the Bible tells us they existed after the flood. Yeah. Yeah. And saints are still on the earth today. Yeah. Alright? Yeah. And they may not look like the way you may envision in them to look like as huge, tall giants. They're smart. Mm -hmm. And they know how to transform themselves to look like ordinary human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, this may bother some of you, but as we continue, you will probably see that the enemy has managed to, because he's the god of this world, small g, he's got his people in key places of position of authority and power in this earth. Yes. Hey. If you doubt what I say, go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We're looking at the scriptures from a fresh perspective today for some of you. We're living in evil times. Very evil times. Ephesians uh, chapter 6. Hallelujah. This is what the Word of God says here. I know this is familiar scriptures, but again, we're looking at it from a different perspective. What does the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12? It says, For we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. But against principalities against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Yes. The Bible tells us this. Mm -hmm. Paul the Apostle tells us this. Yeah. God revealed this to him. And saints, all the government, all, all those who empower, the government powers of all this world, all the countries and high government places, they are being governed by the enemy, because the Bible says he's the God of this world and he has his people in those positions of authority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not talking about ordinary human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this might bother some of you, but you, we've got to start to understand some, spirit, some spiritual truth about what is going on in planet Earth. This Earth is an evil place. Yes. Oh. And, and, and some people that you look up to Celebrities, people in politics, people in sports, newscasters, people who have influenced business people. They look like ordinary human beings like you and myself. Some of them that you may look up to and you idolize somewhat. I trust you don't. But I'm talking on a whole that human beings idolize. Some of these folks are Nephilims. Preach truth. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. Mm -hmm. oh, they don't want anything to do with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can't because it's not in their nature. Come on. How is Satan going to govern this world? He's got to have his own people. Yeah. Makes sense. Now you may be saying, well, how is it that they can take on human form? They're able to do that. Remember, we're not talking about 100% human being. Being a human being, you and I, there's certain things you and I can't do. Can you change yourself into an inanimate object? The answer is no. You can't. Can you change yourself into an animal? You can't. Can you change yourself into another human being? You and I can't, but they can. They know how to do it. They know how to transform themselves. Okay? Yes, you just said it. It's a power of darkness. They know how to transform themselves. This is not, this, they're able to do this. And, this. and as a result, because they're able to do this, that's why we've got to be careful of, of great deception that's in play right now. We've got to be aware of this. All right? So they're able to transform themselves and 
function like what you and I would think is a normal human being, but the reality is they're not. Right? Second yeah. Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 uses words to this effect. And probably you're going to see this verse in a new light. It says, it, the word of God says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, mm -hmm. transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Let me put it another way. That's verse 13. In verse 14, well, before I read verse 14, let me put it another way. The enemy, he's got his spokespeople. You know like how God has his preachers, his evangelists, his teachers, his apostles? Well, the enemy is set up. You know, the enemy copies God, right? So the enemy has his, his uh, the, those who do teaching, yeah. those who are like evangelists, yeah. you know, like promoting his cause, uh, those who are in political authority. So, and who are they? Again, they're there. They're, they're, they're the sportscasters, they're the movie stars, they're the politicians, they're the musicians, they're the celebrities, they're people of influence. Yeah. Scientists. Scientists, yes, 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 all these people. Right? So then we come to verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, the Word of God says, it says, and no marvel. In other words, don't be surprised. This was 2,000 years ago. <laughs> We shouldn't be surprised, but I know some of you are shocked by what you're hearing, and probably some of you are wondering, what is Pastor Paul talking about? He says, and no marvel, for Satan himself is, himself is transformed into an angel of light. In other words, he can do it. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, True. whose end shall be according to their works. Yes. Since it's not every human, it's not everybody that you come in contact with, or you rub shoulders with, or you brush shoulders with, and your day-to-day -day coming as you come and go are 100% human beings. Mm -hmm. You've got to know that. Some of them are Nephilims. Some of them are from a different kingdom altogether, and they're not 100% humans. How are they able to do this? You may be asking the question. Well, they've got some supernatural ability, that's one. Two, they, they get their strength by drinking blood, eating blood. Hence, there's a lot of human sacrifices going on behind the scenes that most people don't know. Right? It's not every time there's an accident takes place or a murder takes place, you, people tend to think, well, it's just an accident. No, 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 they need the blood of human beings to live off. Because if, don't, if they don't, have access to human blood. They lose their human form and they go back to what they naturally are. So they need to live off of human blood. Hence, you've got a restaurant in California called uh, Cannibal Restaurant, along those lines. I'm sure you can go Google it and you'll find it if you want to. I'm not recommending you do. Where people are actually eating human flesh. Is it happening today? Absolutely. But the interesting thing about it, this has been going on for, for this has been going on for eons. But now, because we are in the last days we're in, all a lot of this is coming to light. That in other words, what was hidden is now coming to the light. Why is it coming to light? Because of the times that we're in. Yes. Yes. Where all this in the past was done discreetly, hidden. And some of you know what I'm talking about. In order for individuals to stay in power, governmental, political power, they've got to be tapping into the occult. That's the only way they can stay in power. And the average folk does not know these truths. But the enemy knows it. And the Bible has been talking about it, but the Bible is for us to search it out and understand it. So now since all this is now becoming much more in, the, in your face, because of the times that we're in, that these people are no longer being discreet or hiding it. 
they're open. If, an, if a restaurant can openly advertise this is what they serve, you're tell, if that tells you that they are no longer concerned about hiding this, that the time has come for all this to come out in the open. Do you see? Hallelujah. So the term, and if you want to Google this, you can. You may, you may as well become familiar with this. When they can change from uh, a human being to something else or from something else to a human being, the word used nowadays is called shape shifting. Mm -hmm. yep. Some of you may be familiar with that word, some of you may not be. But it's the, the ability to transform yes. into something. Natural human beings can't do that. And these, and those who are Nephilims, they've got to have blood, human blood, from time to time to keep their human form or else they naturally go back to what they are. So therefore they've got to have a constant supply of human sacrifices. Because remember, the life is in the blood. Do you see? Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Recently, President Biden announced and uh, issued a directive to NASA and Pentagon, some of you may have seen these headlines, that he's given these government agencies X amount of days, it was 180 days, actually it's supposed to happen next month, that they are to declassify all the information that they've kept concealed about uh, terrestrial sightings out of space, UFOs, that's unidentified flying objects, yeah. all these things they're going to now start to declassify and make it public next month. Why am I sharing this? Why do we need to know this? Again, it illustrates we're living in a time when a lot of stuff has been hidden is now going to come to light. And some people are going to go off and say, well, now the aliens are going to come and all this sort of stuff and all this, and they're going to have all this. But I want you to know that the Nephilims are not necessarily from out of space. They're not aliens. They're a result of fallen angels cohabiting with human beings. If you want to say the fallen angels are out of space, yes, but that happened a long, that happened a long time ago. Pardon? They've been here. They've been here for a while. Yes. Okay. So that, so that didn't just happen. Hallelujah. These fallen angels are going to be judged. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The Word of God tells us. Looking to see how much time we got. The Word of God tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. I'm reading a couple verses here. And because of time, I'm going to read them quickly. It says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, and these are the fallen angels, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, taking, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. In the book of Jude, this is what Jude, the brother of Jesus, had to say in verse 5, a couple verses here, he's saying the same thing. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward, hallelujah, destroyed them 
that believe not. Verse 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, this is the ones back in Genesis chapter 6, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now notice this. Both Jude, the brother of Jesus, Peter, the apostle, Peter, are both talking about the same thing. Okay? Okay. And they both compare how, how the sin of these angels with the sin of human beings comparing it to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you all see that? Yeah. They're similar in nature. In the sense that, what, that Sodom and Gomorrah gave themselves over to sexual immorality. They went after strange flesh. Yes. Chapter 6 is the same thing of Genesis. These angels leaving their first estate. They left their heavenly state. They, they, they did not stay where God put them. God created them clean and holy to begin with. They had great responsibilities. But they went after strange flesh as well. Yeah. And these scriptures are here to give us a warning. It says, look, God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to judge them. God judged those angels. He's, just like he judged Sodom and Gomorrah, he will judge all immoral sexual people if they continue in that direction. Amen. Okay? See how this is unfolding. Because it's all happening all around us. You know, um, the Bible warns us as Christians, you know, as believers, that if you lie down with a prostitute, you become one with a prostitute. If you lie down with a, let me put it another further, if you lie down with a criminal, you become one with a criminal. And there's all kinds of studies, statistics to, 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 to show you that Criminality runs in families. Yeah. If they find an individual committing horrendous crimes, they could trace it back and see, oh, your father did it, your grandfather did it, your great-grandfather did this. It was running in the family. And, and therefore, we, as believers, we just can't go lie down with just anybody and everybody. In fact, you're only supposed to lie down with the person you get married to. That's it. Any, any form of sexual activity outside of marriage is a sin in God's eyes. It's called fornication or adultery. And it's immoral in God's sight. Amen. But you know what? Some Christians are comfortable with it. You shouldn't be. Because there's consequences if, you continue, if one continues in that lifestyle. God is it, it's telling us how chapter, in ch chapter 6 how people got messed up. Is it not? Yes. And Jesus said, as in the days of Noah. So you can go along and thinking that, okay, I fall in love with this fellow human being and, and, and uh, I'm, I'm going to let down my guard. I won't even allow myself to get married. I'm going to have sexual intimacy with this individual. You don't know if it's a Nephilim. Oh. You don't know if this trap has been set because the enemy knows that you profess to be a Christian. And now you lie down with this thing? Mm -hmm. And you produce something that you shouldn't be producing? Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. We got, to, we got to really, really not allow... We got to really think about some of these things. The God, the, God has called us to live clean and holy, godly lives. If you profess to be a Christian, if you name the name of Christ, you've, you've, you've got to. Go, go, go with me to Matthew chapter 24. We were there, there just a moment ago. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. But notice in this chapter, in chapter 24, verse 3, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. 
His disciples come to him and ask him some questions. What do they ask him? Let me read it. And as, as he sat upon Mount Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And the end of the world, or your Bible may say the end of the age. Listen to what Jesus said. All throughout the chapter 24, he's, he's answering their question. But there's something that keeps coming up over and over more than once. And verse 4 tells us, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Yeah. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Jesus is warning that when that end of the age comes, there's going to be a lot of deception taking place. And he's saying, you got to watch out for this. Because it's happening as I speak since. Yeah. Okay? you got to watch out for this. Go to verse 11. Right? He's, a second time we see him speaking. He says, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Now, if you were to follow this, and we're not going to go into this detail right now, but chapter 24 of the book of Matthew, it lays out prophetically what's going to happen for the future. As you heard me say before, and I'll say it again, when it says... When it talks about uh, verse 6, you shall hear of wars and rumors of war and see that ye be not troubled for all these things must come to pass but the end of it is not yet but nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Verse 7 has to do with the 1900s because mm -hmm. there was no other time like in that history where the whole world was at war. World War I, World War II. Mm -hmm. You'll see me. Yeah. And it progresses, comes all the way up, okay, to the rapture, to the tribulation days, to the, se to the second coming of Jesus Christ. All in chapter 24. It's, it's all high level. It's all there. Yeah. So when we read in verse 4 and 5, he says, take heed that you're not deceived. Then he mentions it again in verse 11. We, you can see it's progressive. Can you all see this? Yeah. Then, even before the chapter is out, we see Jesus talking about it again in chapter, sorry, in verse 24. The word of God says here in verse 24, he says here, For they shall rise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. What did I say about these Nephilim folks? They can do some things supernaturally more so than natural human beings. Okay? Great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they, sh they shall deceive the very elect. Mm -hmm. Now, by the time we come to verse 24, the elect here is not talking about the church. Okay? It's Israel. All right? Because by the time you get to verse 29, it says immediately after the tribulation of these days, the sun shall be darkened. Right? Yeah. And he goes on to say in verse 25, Behold, I told you before. In other words, you better take heed. I warned you. Great deception is at play. Okay? Yeah. Do not allow yourself to be deceived. And the only way you can present, you prevent yourself from being deceived, you've got to remain plugged into God. You've got to be into the Word of God. You've got to be praying. You've got to have a relationship with Him. You've got to be fellowship with the saints. You've got to play, stay plugged in. You know, attend services on a regular basis. So you stay plugged in. Stay plugged into God. Or else, apart from the Word of God and these things, you can easily be deceived because a lot of people are buying, buying into a lot of things today without even asking any questions or questioning things and accepting it. Because the government says this, they feel compelled, I need to do certain things. And you need to pull back and say, no, no, just because the government says you're supposed to do certain things or people of authority, you should say, what does God want for me? Amen. What is God saying to me? Amen. And after when God has spoken, you have an answer of peace, you go forth and make your decisions. But you, you can't just accept anything and everything that's being coming your way and say, well, I need to go along with it because the majority of folks is going along with it. Don't allow yourself to be deceived. Mm -hmm. Be aware of what's going on. Yes. Amen. Amen. Your Lord. 
be aware of what's happening. Yes. Glory to God. M mind your sense. Know something about the angels of God. The Bible calls the angels of God the sons of God. You can read it in the book of Job. Right? Mm -hmm. In Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, it talks about the sons of God coming and appearing before God. They're the angels of God. It matches up with Genesis chapter 6. They're the angels of God. All right? But the angels of God can also transform themselves too. But well, let, me, let me tell you something. They will do it with God's permission. Right? Amen. Do you understand that? Because yeah. yeah. the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Well, how are they going to present themselves? As a normal human being. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and, and as a normal human being, as you're interacting with them, you, often you won't know you've interacted with an angel until after the fact. Yeah. I'm talking about a, a holy, clean angel. Mm -hmm. Well, if this can happen on, from that perspective, it can also happen on an evil perspective. Sure. That some Christians could find themselves entertaining evil angels. Right? Getting involved with them, interacting with them when the Word of God says, come out from amongst them. The Word of God says, basically, can, can, can light and darkness dwell together? Right? What agreement do they have? Can two walk together except they have their own agreement? Light and darkness can't dwell together. Righteousness and unrighteousness can't dwell together. A holiness and unholiness can't dwell together. You, you got, there's got to be a separation. Hallelujah. We read in the scriptures of Jesus himself. I use this word shapeshift, if you could call it that. In several times in the scriptures where Jesus, in, in, where, where Jesus appears in another form. And he's talking to men and they don't realize he's Jesus until after the fact. Can you see that? Yeah. Right? He, he, he appears and vanishes. The point being, I'm saying that these spiritual beings have the ability to do this. Okay? Jesus can do it. His holy angels can do it. And also Satan, who, can, who, who, who mimics what God does, his people can do it too. Yeah. Yeah. Are you all beginning to sense this now that how dangerous this world is if you're not hooked up to Christ? How evil this world is if you're not hooked up to Christ. Because if you're not hooked up to Christ, you could easily be deceived and you don't even know it. Yes. And yet the Bible has given us some guidelines how to conduct ourselves. And if we ensure that we conduct ourselves appropriately according to the word of God, saints, glory to God, we, we, we won't fall into any of these traps. Okay? We won't fall into the, any of these traps. Hallelujah. Can you bear with me for a few more minutes? I'd just like to wrap this together because I think this is, there's more to be said, but I just, I just want to conclude this part. Hallelujah. And, and here's, here's from a prophetic point of view. In Daniel chapter 2, the Word of God says, it talks about the image that Nebuchadnezzar had. You remember that he dreamt about? Gold head. Remember that? Yeah. Silver, bronze, legs of iron, toes are a what? Uh, iron and clay, re re remember all that? Yeah. Okay, and, and uh, God, through Daniel, gives Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation. But I want, I, want, I want you to see something from a different perspective that you may never have seen it before, so that you know that we are, we're in these times. It says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 42, it says, and as, the toes, and as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. This is prophetically speaking, right? Okay. Verse 43 says, And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Wow. Let me, okay, you might want to underline that. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Saints, these are not ordinary human beings. Mm -hmm. These are the these are the Nephilims. These are the off, these are the offspring. These are the ones that are aligned with the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. And when is this going to happen? In the end days. All right? And the scriptures tell us, These shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
So you, you may ask yourself, well, when is all this going to happen? Well, verse 44 tells us. It says here, it tells us, And in the days of these kings shall the God of the heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. Let me ask the question, has God started to set up his kingdom? Yes. The answer is yes. yes. Right? Yes. And the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. All the kingdoms that that image represented from the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the toes, the iron and clay. You remember if you keep reading, the stone comes out and smashes it and it smashes it to powder and God sets up a kingdom. God has already started to set up his kingdom. Jesus has already started to set up his kingdom. Yeah. It's in play. Yeah. So the key in, in keeping in context with this message, verse 43 says, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They are already mingling themselves amongst us. Yeah. I'm talking about the Nephilims. Yeah. Okay? But they shall not cleave one to another. It's not going to work. In other words, Satan's scheme is overall, long term, is not going to work from God's perspective. Amen. Okay? You got to catch this sense. Yes. But you need to be aware of all this. Revelation chapter 17, I'm just reading, it says, verse 1, it says, And they came, and they came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and Talk with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I'll show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth on many waters. Many waters is people, right? Mm -hmm. Unto whom the kings of the earth have what? Committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Well, who are the inhabitants of the earth? Those are the human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. And the demons are, cast, you know, like to cast down, there's intermingling, there's that sexual immorality taking place yes. Yes. as we saw in Genesis chapter 6 that Jesus himself referred to as in the days of Noah yes yes, yes. yes. Truth. if you want to get a little bit more information if you want to I'm going to give you a video that you can a name of a video go google this on YouTube Arizona Wilder. It's an interview with Arizona Wilder, code name. And this lady gives an interview of her experience of observing and, and observing individuals who are known Nephilims. I'm not going to call it out, but you go and see for yourself and you conclude all this. This, this woman lived it. When I say lived it, she observed and watched and saw human sacrifices and saw certain key people participating in these things. Arizona Wilder, you can Google it and you'll see. I'm closing with Malachi chapter, Micah chapter 7, sorry. Micah chapter 7. The Word of God says in verse 1, Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits as the great gleaning of the vintage, there is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit. In other words, I want, I'm looking for the summer fruit. And there is no summer fruit. The good man is perished out of the earth. And there is none upright among men. This is tribulation days it's referring to. They lie in wait for what? Blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. That is what it's going to be like during the tribulation days. Okay? Y'all seen this? Yes. Oh, saints. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying today. I know this message may, a bit be, may be a bit difficult for some of you to comprehend. But don't reject it. Don't close it out. Okay? What I'm sharing with you is, is truth. You just need to take it, digest it, pray about it. And let God lead you into more truth if you desire to know more about this. But here is it. You need to be aware of the times we're living in. It's not every human being you ought to trust. It's not everything you ought to be following. The Bible says broad is the road that leads to destruction. And narrow is the, is, the, is the road that leads to life. And few there be find it. This is not the time for walking the broad road that leads to destruction. This is not the time for lying down with just anybody and everybody. Mm -hmm. Get back to biblical, life, biblical uh, truth 
and make sure you're living clean and holy. The thing that messed up the people back in, Gen in Genesis chapter 6 was sexual immorality. The same thing that's going to mess up the people that in the days of the Son of Man, the coming Son of Man, is going to be sexual immorality. That's going to be one of many ways. Make sure that's not part of your life Amen. as a believer. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The enemy is deceptive and he's working his deception. And he's working it through many channels, many ways. And there's going to be signs, wonders, and all kinds of supernatural things taking place. And it's happening already. And people who do not know the truth, what the Word of God says, will fall into that and be deceived. If you do not love the truth, according to Thessalonians, you will be deluded yes. with a strong delusion. Mm -hmm. Don't go there. Don't fall for everything. Be aware of what is going on. We're living in an evil world. And the Bible says, well, it's, it's perilous times. It's easy to fall into a trap. But with God's help, if you stay connected to Christ, you won't fall into it. Amen. You won't be deceived. You say, well, well, well let, me, let me just end, end with this. Don't tolerate, those of you who have dreams, everybody should be dreaming, but those of you who have sexual dreams, don't accept them in your dreams. They're spirits. Yeah. And they want to interact with you. Mm -hmm. And they want to mess you up spiritually. Don't accept it. If you find yourself having dreams like these, when you wake up, pray about it, reject it, plead the blood of Jesus, cancel it, do whatever you can. In other words, don't tolerate it. Amen. The enemy will come in a, in, in a form. He could come in, your, in the form that it's your spouse. He could come in the form of your girlfriend. He could come in the form of your boyfriend, a former girlfriend, former boyfriend, former wife, former somebody. He will come. And, and if you let down your guard and you sleep in your dream, you fall into that trap. Yeah. Don't accept it. Amen. It's deception. And his goal is to mess you up. And since these are the consequences, this is almost like another message, but these are the consequences that happens when we violate God's sexual laws. Yes. All right? These are the consequences. So we've got to realize that if you're experiencing dreams like that, you've got to go back and repent of sexual immoral activity that you may have had in your youth. And says, God, I'm asking you to forgive me. I mean, yes, you're a believer and you're saved and you're on your way to heaven, but specifically so that these dreams can stop and don't continue, you will have to pray specifically and close those doors because the door, the enemy is using those doors. Just like the enemy used the door in Genesis chapter 6 because Adam and Eve sinned to bring in his fallen angels to mess up the human race, former past sins, the enemy can use those doors if they're still open to come in and try to mess you up to disrupt your Christian walk. When you think you're going two steps forward, you'll find yourself three steps backwards. No saints. Oh, hear what God is saying today and take heed to what the Word of God is saying. We're living in a time of deception. Amen. It's happening in all kinds of levels. Yes. Personally, collectively, government-wise, mm -hmm. church-wise, mm -hmm. community-wise. It's happening all over. You've got to be aware of it so that you don't become a part of it. And you don't yield to it. Hallelujah. Let me leave this with you. But I believe the Lord has more to say. And this might be a bit heavy for today. But um, if it is, you pray about it. And if it is, let's talk about it. That's what Bible studies are for. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Because uh, we're living in strange times. Mm -hmm. And these are not ordinary times we're living in. Mm -hmm. And the things that the Bible has talked about, we see it unfolding right before us. Okay? These are the days of Genesis chapter 6. Be aware. Jesus warned us. And it's playing out. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, 
I thank you for your holy word that's gone forth. Your truth. It might be a bit difficult for some people to receive and accept. But I pray by your spirit that you would speak to your people and give them all deeper spiritual understanding and help them to understand the seriousness and the gravity of the truth of your words that have just gone forth. And I'm asking you to uh, open up your word more to them, confirming your word more, confirming your truth more. And I pray you help every one of us to take heed, to stay plugged into Christ. Amen. Your word, prayer, relationship with you. Amen. So we'll not be deceived because your word says even the very elect, if you don't interrupt, could easily be deceived. So it means that the deception can be get so overwhelming that if one is not in Christ, they could fall into that trap. I'm asking you to keep every one of us in the way that we should go. Amen. And help every one of us to be sincere with you. Amen. And to be honest with you. Amen. And if there's things that are not right in our lives, to truly and sincerely repent and get right with you. Mm -hmm. So that it may be well with us. Yes. And if any one of us have any doors open that the enemy is using to deceive us, mm -hmm. I'm asking you all, I'm asking you to help every one of us to take the steps to sincerely repent and close those doors yes, so the enemy no longer has access to torment or to trouble or to deceive anymore. Amen. Oh Father, keep us in the way that we should go. Give us eyes to see yes. what we ought to see. Yes, give us understanding to understand what we ought to understand. Yes, and give us deeper spiritual understanding, I pray, and help us to walk right, live right, do what is right in thy sight. Yes that it might be well with us, that when you come for the church, every one of us that hears this word, hears this message, will be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming upon this earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Because we'll stand with the victory. We will have obtained the victory. Help us not to be deceived. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.